creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The extraordinary... Tell someone about it. I wish I knew how anybody could guess something so accurately in advance. Days later, her terrible vision came true. The Extraordinary is the random, unexplained appearance of ghosts at Port Arthur. Ghosts caught on film. I'm totally shocked when, you know, the photos were developed. It is the strange twist of fate that returned a treasured ring to Marjorie Dow. A ring swallowed up by the sea and thought lost forever. The Extraordinary is the day actress Angie Dickinson came face to face with the hereafter. A day she will always treasure. That wonderful discovery that I made while on my way to, uh, to death that was so fascinating and so simple Not a clue what it was. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on The Extraordinary. Strangely, Angie Dickinson says she will always treasure her experience. More on that later. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. In the blink of an eye, our entire world can change. A fraction of a second can be the difference between bliss and catastrophe. A flicker in the course of fate can overwhelm us with instant riches or take from us all that we possess. The vulnerability of our average daily life, if dwelled upon, might be enough to scare us to stay in bed forever. This is the story of a young family that locked itself inside from cruel winter elements and then discovered its smallest member had wandered off into the dangers outside. Raphael Abramovitz reports. On the outside, fierce winds whipped rain and snow off the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. They swept low and raised hell on the roofs in small towns like Elkins, where entire communities swayed to the will of winter storms in December. Sleet and ice beat in irregular rhythm against the windows of the home of Steve and Melinda Eichelberger. But on the inside, there was warmth and peace. It was 9 p.m., and dawn would bring Christmas Eve the Eichelbergers were a family, and at this time of year, neither cold nor hardship would keep the family from feeling cozy. Start snowing probably in the middle of the night. I think temperatures got down to 27 degrees. Steve had been laid off his job a week earlier. Melinda, seven months pregnant, had tomorrow off. They'd spent Christmas Eve together with three-year-old daughter, Brittany. Come here. What do you want? A baby sister or a baby brother? A baby sister. The gifts were wrapped. The aroma of freshly baked Christmas cookies filled and warmed the room while Steve and Melinda played with Brittany. We was baking the cookies and she was helping me decorate them, putting the sprinkles on it. And she was real excited, couldn't wait for Christmas Day. She was excited she was going to have a sister in a couple months. You want for you? Heat from Melinda's baking filled the cabin. Brittany decided to take a bath. She only wanted to sleep in her underwear and her T-shirt. She wouldn't put her nightgown on. So then she went in the living room and started watching car Christmas cartoons with her daddy. And then they both fell asleep. <laughs> While Melinda finished her baking, Steve left the living room and went to bed. She decided to let Brittany continue sleeping on the sofa. I didn't want to wake Brittany up yet because I wasn't done. So I just went ahead and covered her up, and I went in the kitchen to wash the dishes. 
So after I got my dishes done, I come out and sat on the sofa to watch TV. So I wasn't sleepy yet. It was probably about 11.30 at night. So then I fell asleep and I woke up about 3.30. Melinda decided not to disturb her little girl. She covered her warmly, kissed her goodnight, and joined her husband in their bedroom. She felt safe. It was Christmas and the new year would bring good luck. started work at 5 a.m., but this morning she woke at about 9.30. When I woke up, Brittany hadn't come in the bedroom. She usually come in and crawl in bed with us in the mornings, or she'd come in and wake me up to watch cartoons. So when I woke up and I didn't hear her, I went to look for her. Brittany! And when I went into the living room, I seen the front door open, and she wasn't anywhere around. So I started looking through the house. I looked in the closets and behind the sofa, all of her little hiding places, and I couldn't find her. Brittany! So I went in there and told, woke Steve up and told him that I couldn't find Brittany. By the time the truth became unavoidable, the screen door had iced up. It meant hours had passed since the three-year-old had gone outside. With the sub-zero morning cold, the wind had dropped. The sleet had turned hard and snow banks had blown up against the sides of the cabins. Icicles hung from rooftops and the air was still and silent. Then, through the stillness of the morning, a piercing scream. I was real hysterical. I was screaming. Steve was on the other side of me, but he was looking the other direction, so he didn't see her at first. And all he heard me was screaming, and then he knew that I'd found her. Brittany was frozen where she fell collapsed, her lips blue and rigid, her arms and legs stiff. Melinda watched Steve pick her up and the little girl's legs and arms did not bend, a beautiful, tragic baby doll. The first thing I thought was, oh God, she's dead. Because when I glanced over at her, all I could see was her toes sticking up from the snow and you could see her hair. And her, most of her body was covered up with snow, except for her face and her hair. And her eyes were wide open. Her lips were blue. Her fingers and hands was blue. And her legs were so stiff they didn't even bend when he picked her up. Baby, baby. Yeah, I like it. She was out in the snow, and now she's frozen. She's really cold. Steve called the emergency the squad at nearby Davis Memorial Hospital. Paramedic Laura Teeter had just finished her shift when the call came in to her supervisor. I could just hear bits and pieces of what she was saying. I heard something about a frozen child, and, and um, I heard her ask, you know, things such as, was she breathing? Hi. Brenda Daly was a volunteer paramedic who had only stopped in for coffee when the call came to the emergency room. We knew that we had a hypothermia case, so you prepare yourself to treat minor you know, to moderate hypothermia. We get on scene, there's, there's this neighbor doing CPR on her. She was, she was outside in, in, uh, in the snow, right? I don't know how long she was out there. Yeah, I just right checked there. her for breathing and, and for a pulse, and there was no pulse. There was no respiration. She was extremely cold. So I began mouth to mouth and CPR on her. Anything? It was a real sinking feeling to, to hear her doing, because we knew this was a child, and this child was was obviously dead. It was real eerie to see her laying there. Even when they were doing CPR, her eyes were still wide open. But there was just no response. You know what you're doing. It had been three or four hours since Brittany wandered into the cold and froze solid. There was no way of telling for sure. 
Steve Eichelberger rode with his daughter in the ambulance to the hospital. Melinda rode with a neighbor, and the fear and guilt overwhelmed him. And I felt really guilty, like it was all my fault. I was real hysterical and upset. I didn't really know what to think. I kept getting to mind, I kept thinking all the way there about her laying in her casket with her Christmas dress on. That's all I kept thinking. Brittany was wheeled into Davis Memorial Emergency Room at 10.45 a.m. Her temperature was 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Normal body temperature is 98.6. She had been to all appearances dead for at least 40 minutes since they had found her in the snow. Nobody knows how long before that. Her heart monitor showed a flat line. Dr. John Veach was on duty. Medicine doesn't declare anyone officially dead unless they are warm and dead. She looked like death. She was uh, pulseless. Uh, she had no spontaneous respirations. Her pupils were fixed and dilated. And in essence, our goal was to warm this child up, to bring her core body temperature up enough so that her metabolism would begin to accelerate and that uh, we could actually resuscitate her. We have to warm her from Beach the ordered heat lamps, a hypothermia blanket, a warm water stomach flush. Steve and Melinda refused to accept the vibrant little girl was gone. Dr. Veach added intravenous fluids, humidified oxygen, constant heart massage. Slowly, Brittany's temperature began to rise. He introduced cardiac drugs. Still no sign of life. And I was just thinking about all of her presents that weren't open and what was I going to do with them. I didn't want to give them away. And if she's not going to be there to open them up, I didn't want to have Christmas. And I was worried about the baby I was carrying. What was I going to do with that baby if I couldn't take care of the one I had? I felt real bad at the time. About 1 p.m., Laura Tita noticed fluid trickling from Brittany's nose, then slight movement, a subtle curve in the flat line of the monitor. Everyone in the room moved faster. There was hope. About 2.15 p.m., Dr. Veach put his hand to Brittany's neck and called out, Pulse! Pulse. He had a pulse. It should have been impossible, but their three-year-old patient's heart was beating on its own. He was like, I feel a pulse. And I just kind of looked at him, you know, because this is like three hours, three and a half, three hours, 40 minutes, something down the road. And I'm just kind of looking at him like, what? I was doing compressions, actually, when he stopped and said, let's do a pulse check, and he did. And uh, he checked, and... He said, I've got a pulse, and it was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm liable to start crying because I, I usually do. The unspoken question on all their minds, how much brain damage had Brittany suffered, deprived of oxygen for so many hours? More than one time I thought, yeah, what have we done, you know, what, uh, she's a beautiful little girl, but will she ever be able to enjoy life? Will she have any quality of life if we even are able to save her? With her temperature now 84 degrees Fahrenheit, Veach ordered the little girl transferred by helicopter to Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Melinda and Steve were shocked by the sight of the little girl being wheeled down the hospital corridor. She was wrapped in blankets of aluminum foil, her eyes taped shut. Tubes forced fluids and oxygen down her throat. I'm thinking, oh my God, my little baby's gonna die. There was one nurse there, I can remember seeing her, and she was just crying really hard. And that, as soon as I looked at her, I just bust out bawling worse. <laughs> While Melinda and Steve drove the icy highways to Pittsburgh, hope grew for Laura and Brenda throughout the ride with Brittany. Laura said to her, she said, Brittany's a good girl. And she stopped thrashing and shook her head yes. So Laura and I just kind of look at each other, what? <laughs> What's going on back here? It's kind of spooky. And we started singing Christmas songs to her because when we would sing to her, she'd lie still. We sang every little Christmas song we could think of from here to Benedum Airport. And uh, while we would do that, she would lay still and listen. When we'd stop singing, she'd start fighting again. But when Brittany arrived at 4.40 p.m., her neurological signs were still only faint. She had no response even to painful stimuli. Throughout Christmas Eve and into Christmas Day, 
Melinda and Steve Eichelberger sat and cried and prayed. Past midday until late Christmas afternoon, they waited silently. But by now, Melinda had a strong feeling. You know, Christmas Day, when her, she finally opened up her eyes, then we knew that I knew she was going to be OK. And in the passing hours, Brittany seemed to focus more and more intently on her mother. Her alertness grew rapidly over the next 24 hours. Tests would show she miraculously had suffered no brain damage. And at 4 p.m. on the afternoon of the day after Christmas 1990, the sun broke through high clouds over the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. And as doctors removed the last tube from the throat of their three-year-old patient, a little girl called out the word, Mommy. I believe this was a miracle on Christmas Day because she could have just been gone just like that. We would have never seen her again. She was determined not to die. Imagine having a premonition so clear, so vivid, that nothing you do will erase it from your mind. Imagine, too, a premonition that involves human tragedy of massive proportions. One you cannot place in time or location. A vision of disaster. For Dawn Thomas, such a vision occurred and troubled her so much, she just had to tell someone. When you're there on your own, he's here on the phone, right across your own. Welcome to another Wednesday night edition of the Open Line Show. Brian Wilshire with you through until 12 tonight, inviting your calls on the Open Line 269. I've been here at 2GB for over 13 years now. I suppose I've spoken to more than 20,000 people on the Open Line. And as you would expect, with a sample size that large, we get some strange calls and uh, talk to some pretty strange people. And one of the strangest calls of all was put through to Brian Wilshire early in October 1979. It was a regular listener, a woman who told the switchboard she had to talk to Brian urgently. She just called out of the blue, not on air though, this was off air, and she said, look, I've just had this premonition, this terrible feeling there's going to be a plane crash. Yeah, let somebody know in advance. That caller was Dawn Thomas, who told the talkback host she'd had the premonition in a dream, a vivid dream that had disturbed her greatly. I was walking down a street in an unfamiliar city and I was watching an aircraft flying over sort of the position I was walking in and I saw it fly into a cloud of bad weather and then as it emerged from the cloud I noticed that there was smoke pouring from the back of it, that it was flying somehow erratically and that from the rear of the plane I could hear people screaming and I found myself thinking oh, those people are going to die watching this aircraft. Not only did she hear the sound of the crash, Dawn Thomas told Wilshire she could make out some of the details of the doomed airliner. I described it as being similar to a 727 and the colours were red on white but I was quite sure that it wasn't Qantas even though it was an international airline. And I had an impression of a voice from somewhere saying, you have to expect this in Melbourne. And yet I was aware that wherever I was, it certainly wasn't, Mel it was a pl place that was not familiar to me at all. As he listened to Dawn's premonition unfold, Wiltshire took notes. A red and white aircraft, like a 727. Bad weather. A crash in an unfamiliar country. Passengers at the back of the plane killed, and some unexplained connection with Melbourne. Brian Wiltshire was certainly fascinated, but he decided not to broadcast news of Dawn's call. After all, there was nothing really concrete, not even an airline or a flight number. And it was only a premonition, a premonition which could cause widespread and unnecessary panic for a day nothing happened and then 
Two days later, I got the story in from the newsroom that a Swiss air jet had crashed on landing at Athens airport. One theory is that the DC-8 simply went out of control as the runway was wet from a rainstorm and there were strong gusts of wind. On television that night, more pieces of the jigsaw fell into place. And to Wiltshire's astonishment, more and more, the picture resembled the Dawn Thomas dream. 14 passengers were killed in the crash. All of them suffocated in the back of the aircraft. The other 142 passengers escaped. Among them was another startling connection with the premonition. There were two Australians on board the plane who weren't injured, both of whom came from Melbourne. Now remember, just two days before the disaster, Dawn Thomas had predicted all those elements. And there was more. Although the plane that crashed was a DC-8, to a layman, it is similar to a 727. Then there were the colours, red on white, according to Dawn's dream. Well, Swiss Air's planes are white with the company's logo on the tail, a white cross on a red background. And finally, the weather in Athens was appalling that Sunday, October the 7th. We would like to hear from you. Give us a call now. To this day, Brian Wilshire has no explanation for that phone call out of the blue, that prediction which was so tragically accurate. I wish I knew how anybody could guess something so accurately in advance. Um, it, is, it is very disturbing to think that it's possible to tap into future events. And as for Dawn Thomas, memories of her dream, those two suspense-filled days of waiting, and the crash itself, will remain with her as long as she lives. There's all kinds of feelings that a person has to live with when they have an experience like that. There's a feeling of helplessness, guilt and responsibility, like I should have been able to do something. Coming up, the ghosts of Port Arthur. Ghosts caught on film. It's the value-only camera, and the photographs on either side of this negative are just perfectly normal. The day Hollywood star Angie Dickinson's routine visit to the doctor transformed into a face-to-face -face encounter with the hereafter. And as I was approaching this white light in this kind of tunnel, the answer to life unfolded and it was so simple. And the chance in a million return of a treasured ring to a young bride-to-be. Many parts of the world have ghostly histories, long-standing links with things unexplained. Australia is not without its share. Generations have passed on stories of ghostly figures haunting old buildings and homes, tragic souls unable to find peace after death. At Port Arthur in Tasmania, ghost stories have flourished for many years. Even in the 1990s, strange visions appear. Some have been caught on film. Port Arthur in southeast Tasmania is a paradox. It is one of the most beautiful places on earth, but its history is brutal and barbaric. Established in 1830, it soon became Australia's most notorious prison, a desolate outpost for 12,000 convicts. There's a feeling here. It's a real feeling of sadness. It's here during the day, but it's here at night as well. There was a lot of tragedy went on here. Exactly the kind of place you'd expect to find the unexpected and the unexplained. Like this mysterious apparition, captured on film by a Victorian couple one weekend last year. Their photograph may just show one of the ghosts of Port Arthur 
a ghost we'll be telling you more about later. Today, the ruins of the colony seem to reach up to the heavens. But back in the convict days, Port Arthur was more like hell. Where once the condemned wasted away, now the curious can wander. You can still see the solitary cells where men were confined until they went mad. Some say the tortured souls of prisoners are still trapped within these forbidding and windswept walls. For more than a hundred years, there have been stories of the lost returning to haunt the living. As a guide at Port Arthur, Pat Perry heard them all. But in 1989, she had her own encounter with the unknown. I was sitting in the tea room adjacent to the main room in the museum, filling in my worksheet for the week. And another guide was sitting a few feet away from me on the same bench. And he said, the ashtray, that ashtray just moved. And I said, don't be silly. And just as I said it, it moved along slowly closer in my direction and then it turned a right angle and I immediately put my hand under the bench thinking it was going to topple off but it didn't it just balanced on the end of the bench. Leslie Kirby had her brush with the ghosts of Port Arthur about the same time. One afternoon I was sitting in the medical officer's house I was doing some research for some people sitting by the fireside and I became aware of the sound of children talking, laughing as it sounded. A century ago, the doctors, their wives and children lived here. The only bright spot in this depressing and God-forsaken place. Perhaps it was the echo of those earlier times that filtered down to Leslie Kirby. To this day, I can't explain where that sound came from. It was very clear, very distinct, just as I'm speaking now, but just no explanation. Then there's Nanny's room, where the woman who cared for the first Commandant's children lived and died mysteriously. Today, it's just as it was in the 1800s, even down to Nanny's old rocking chair. That's Another unusual thing about this house, there have been uh, two occasions that I know of that the chair has been seen rocking by itself. Andrew Simmons is another guide at the penal settlement. He's helped compile a book on the ghosts of Port Arthur, but not even he can explain the strange things that happen here in Nanny's room. For instance, the trouble many tourists have with their cameras. Flashlights that don't function, shutters that simply refuse to click, and strangest of all, these apparitions. On display in Nanny's room are two examples. Photographs taken by visitors, and in each case, there's a mysterious flash of light through the frame. Thousands of tourists pass through Nanny's room every year. Some say the prints are ghostly, others are dubious. At first, Melbourne couple David and Simone Shaw were among the disbelievers, but soon they were to be converted. I said to David, I'll take a photo of me and the ghost, just jokingly, and um, I put my arm around the rocking chair and he took the photo and then straight away I took his photo standing next to the rocking chair and, and the um, mantelpiece. The last thing we expected was to, something to come up and we were totally shocked when, you know, the photos were developed. This was the photograph that shocked Simone and her husband. There, right through the centre of frame, is that flash. But the Shaws are convinced that there is more to their photograph than meets the eye. It's a face of a lady. Um, you can tell it's a lady because it sort of looks like she's got, well, it sounds dumb, but lipstick on. Um, the lips are really prominent. Now, at first glance, you may not be able to make out the woman's face. But when the image is enhanced, perhaps it will become clearer. 
a ghostly image or the camera playing tricks. The Shaws couldn't decide, so Simone's father, Jack van der Corpet, decided to get an independent analysis. He had both the camera and negatives checked by photographic experts at Melbourne University. It's a very ordinary camera and the photographs on either side of this negative are just perfectly normal. So if any light had come into the camera, then it would have been also shown on the other two negatives. The experts have said that they've got absolutely no explanation why that image appeared on the photograph, or actually on the negative. The years seem to quicken their pace as we grow older, even for movie stars. But there is no more radiant example of ageless beauty I can think of than the movie world's Angie Dickinson. She is as immortal on screen today as ever. But there was a day during the most routine visit to her doctor that Angie came face to face with the hereafter. Believe it or not, it was a moment she treasures. From policewoman to dress to kill, to an upcoming miniseries, Wild Palms, Hollywood continues its love affair with Angie Dickinson. Earthy, sexy, vulnerable, and unapologetic for her life and loves, she is still known as one of the kindest celebrities in the Hollywood community. Married and divorced from composer Burt Bacharach and the mother of daughter Nikki, she lives amidst the serene beauty of the canyons in Beverly Hills. It was here we visited her. I believe in God. Definitely, I believe in God. But that God is a higher being rather than a man with a beard and a white gown. Um, because there's too much to do for one fella in a beard and a white gown. He couldn't possibly do it all. So he may be God, but there's somebody over him. <laughs> I believe in fate, but I don't believe in fate to the point where you don't have to do anything and you say, oh, well, whatever it'll be, that's going to be my fate. No, that's uh, one objection I have to some religions is though, well, God will take care of it. Well, no, he won't. He's busy telling that fella in the white robes what to do. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to die. And I do think there's a big difference. I think, frankly, I think when you die, you die. You know, so nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing there. Maybe there is. And there's one story Angie has never told before. Something which happened close to 30 years ago. Well, I had one experience and uh, you, you, um, Uh, extraordinary is an understatement. I had a uh, penicillin shot and I went into anaphylactic shock. And if you've never heard of anaphylactic shock, most of it is because the people are dead. And in the dictionary it even says, and most people die. Uh, but not me. And um, so everything shuts down and you go into shock, period. So I was uh, on my way to dying, and I saw the uh, white robe, the fella, that I firmly believed in then as a, uh, as a being, you know. Um, and I saw the white light. And while I was uh, um, dying, and as I was approaching this white light in this kind of tunnel, the answer to life unfolded and it was so simple that I thought, you know, I'm probably one of the few artists that this has happened to who could therefore come back, dramatize it, tell about it, um, have that wonderful answer 
to life. I can hardly wait. If I pull through this and don't die, I will have it. I lived, happy to say, uh, but that, um, that wonderful discovery that I made while on my way to, uh, to death that was so fascinating and so simple, I have not a clue what it was. <laughs> Luck. Some say we make our own. Others believe unknown forces enter our lives at various times to either help or hinder our progress. 82-year-old Marjorie Dow was born in England and knows better than most how fate can take a hand in our everyday lives. But the question to ask is, was what happened to Marjorie luck? or something else. Marjorie Dow is 82 now, a woman with a lifetime of memories. But there's one that is more vivid than most, the memory of an event Marjorie calls a miracle. As children, my sister and I were each given a ring. Now, mine was my birthstone, which is a ruby and it was a ruby surrounded by small diamonds and it was already an antique ring i don't know it would have been well over a hundred years old and it had claws you know the big gold claws to hold the stones in years passed times changed the great depression of the 30s set in just surviving was an ordeal and finally in utter desperation, Marjorie was forced to do the unthinkable. She had to pawn her special ring. When I finally managed to get work, I scrimped and scraped and saved the money to be to, so that I could redeem it. And I did. I got it back. Now, the ring was even more special. After all, it had helped get her through the depression. Marjorie's luck began to change. She was saving a little money, enough for a weekend away at a small hotel in Devonshire. Now, my boyfriend, who wasn't invited to go with me, had got wind of this, and unbeknown to me, he found out the hotel and booked himself in. A wonderful surprise, a weekend with Laurie the young man she'd one day marry. First thing Saturday morning, the excited couple set out for a day at the coast. The day was chilly and rather windy, and we were bemoaning the fact that although we'd got our swim things with us, uh, it was too cold to go in the water. Despite the weather, Marjorie and Laurie decided to rest on the cliff top, overlooking the turbulent sea. So we'd taken a bit of a picnic lunch, you know, and we were doing a bit of canoodling, I suppose. <laughs> you know, I was forgiving him for having come down. And um, uh, then it was time to go back again to the hotel for lunch. And uh, the wind had disarranged all my hair, you know, it's blown it all about. So I thought, oh, I'd better just tidy it up. And uh, I slipped my ring off my finger and put it down on the raincoat on which we were sitting because the claws would catch in the hair. And so I tidied my hair up and I was just bending down to pick up the ring when my boyfriend stood up and shook the raincoat out over the cliff. And oh, oh, I was absolutely devastated as you can imagine <laughs> and then nothing would do we had to get into our swim things and we dived into this freezing cold weather water <laughs> and uh, you know dived continuously searching the bottom but it was no good couldn't find it so then we had to go 
and go back to the hotel. For Marjorie and Laurie, the day ended in disaster. The ring had vanished in the rolling surf. Strong ocean currents could carry it kilometres in any direction in a matter of hours. For two days, the couple went back to the scene of the disaster. For two days, they combed the beach for the missing ring. But by Monday, Laurie was convinced that the search was hopeless. Laurie was getting really angry and impatient with me because I was acting in a most ridiculous manner because, you know, I would not see how impossible and hopeless it was in the expectation of ever finding that ring again. So uh, he was virtually going to drag me away. And as a last desperate effort, I clasped my hands and I shut my eyes tight and I prayed as I'd never, ever prayed before in my life. Marjorie was praying for a miracle. That one chance in a million. The chance that somehow the ring would be recovered. And then when I opened my eyes, I couldn't believe it. Between my bare feet, there was the ring. And that's why I call it my miracle ring. Once again, Marjorie and her precious heirloom had been separated. Once again, they'd been reunited. Now, Marjorie's passed the miracle ring onto her son, hoping and praying it will continue to spread good fortune for generations to come. Two passengers on a light plane. The pilot collapsed at the controls. Those on board don't know how to fly. There is only one chance of survival. One in a million. An untold story. Next week. The story of the plane without a pilot will take your breath away. That's next week. By the way, Thanks for all your letters during our last series. For those with a story to tell, our address is Post Office Box 462, Newport Beach, New South Wales, 2106. We'd really like to hear from you. That's all we've got time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. As we go, I'd like to show you something else from next week's show. It's about the night Don Lane saw a ghost and how years later, Bert Newton got real proof of Don's experience. Good night. See you in the future. In this radio studio at 3UZ, all of a sudden, for no God-given reason, my chair collapsed. And it was a strong, sturdy, radio-type chair that aren't supposed to collapse. People who are listening to the radio would have thought, these guys are nuts, they're doing sight gags on radio, you know? And anyway, he was sitting down on the floor and we were really laughing about it. And I just pointed my finger at him and I said, I told you someday she was going to get you. And she got you. <laughs> Good night joined her husband in their bedroom. She felt safe. It was Christmas and the new year would bring good luck.
Brenda usually started work at 5 a.m., but this morning she woke at about 9.30. When I woke up, Brittany hadn't come in the bedroom. She usually come in and crawl in bed with us in the mornings, or she'd come in and wake me up to watch cartoons. So when I woke up and I didn't hear her, I went to look for her. Brittany! And when I went into the living room, I seen the front door open, and she wasn't anywhere around. So I started looking through the house. I looked in the closets and behind the sofa, all of her little hiding places, and I couldn't find her. Brittany! So I went in there and told, woke Steve up and told him that I couldn't find Brittany. By the time the truth became unavoidable, the screen door had iced up. It meant I creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear, and touch, beyond all we understand, lies. <laughs> someone about it. I wish I knew how anybody could guess something so accurately in advance. Days later, her terrible vision came true. The Extraordinary is the random, unexplained appearance of ghosts at Port Arthur. Ghosts caught on film. I'm totally shocked when, you know, the photos were developed. It is the strange twist of fate that returned a treasured ring to Marjorie Dow. A ring swallowed up by the sea and thought lost forever. The extraordinary is the day actress Angie Dickinson came face to face with the hereafter. A day she will always treasure. That wonderful discovery that I made while on my way to, uh, to death that was so fascinating and so simple. I have not a clue what it was. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding tonight on The Extraordinary. Strangely, Angie Dickinson says she will always treasure... Hours had passed since the three-year-old had gone outside. With the sub-zero morning cold, the wind had dropped. The sleet had turned hard, and snow banks had blown up against the sides of the cabins. Icicles hung from rooftops, and the air was still and silent. Then, through the stillness of the morning, a piercing scream. I was real hysterical. I was screaming. Steve was on the other side of me, but he was looking the other direction, so he didn't see her at first. And all he heard me was screaming, and then he knew that I'd found her. Brittany was frozen where she fell or collapsed. Her lips blue and rigid, her arms and legs stiff. Melinda watched Steve pick her up, and the little girl's legs and arms did not bend. A beautiful, tragic baby doll. First thing I thought was, oh God, she's dead. Because when I glanced over at her, all I could see was her toes sticking up from the snow, and you could see her hair. And her, most of her body was covered up with snow, except for her face and her hair. And her eyes were wide open, her lips were blue, her fingers and hands was blue, and her legs were so stiff they didn't even bend when he picked her up. Baby, baby. Yeah. She was out in the snow, and now she's frozen. She's really cold. Steve called the emergency squad at nearby Davis Memorial Hospital. <laughs> Paramedic Laura Teeter had just finished her shift when the call came in to her supervisor. I could just hear bits and pieces of what she was saying. I heard something about uh, frozen. Who's it? Start snowing probably in the middle of the night. I think temperatures got down to 27 degrees. Steve had been laid off his job a week earlier. Melinda, seven months pregnant, had tomorrow off. They'd spent Christmas Eve together with three-year-old daughter, Brittany. Come here. What do you want? A baby sister or a baby brother? A baby sister. The gifts were wrapped. The aroma of freshly baked Christmas cookies filled and warmed the room while Steve and Melinda played with Brittany. 
was baking the cookies and she was helping me decorate them, putting the sprinkles on it. And she was real excited, couldn't wait for Christmas Day. She was excited because she was going to have a sister in a couple months. He went for you. Heat from Melinda's baking filled the cabin. Brittany decided to take a bath. She only wanted to sleep in her underwear and her T-shirt. She wouldn't put her nightgown on. So then she went in the living room and started watching cart Christmas cartoons with her daddy. And then they both fell asleep. <laughs> While Melinda finished her baking, Steve left the living room and went to bed. She decided to let Brittany continue sleeping on the sofa. I didn't want to wake Brittany up yet because I wasn't done. So I just went ahead and covered her up, and I went in the kitchen to wash the dishes. So after I got my dishes done, I come out and sat on the sofa to watch TV. So I wasn't sleepy yet. It was probably about 11.30 at night. So then I fell asleep, and I woke up about 3.30. Melinda decided not to disturb her little girl. She covered her warmly, kissed her, her experience. More on that later. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. In the blink of an eye, our entire world can change. A fraction of a second can be the difference between bliss and catastrophe. A flicker in the course of fate can overwhelm us with instant riches or take from us all that we possess. The vulnerability of our average daily life, if dwelled upon, might be enough to scare us to stay in bed forever. This is the story of a young family that locked itself inside from cruel winter elements and then discovered its smallest member had wandered off into the dangers outside. Raphael Abramovitz reports. On the outside, fierce winds whipped rain and snow off the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. They swept low and raised hell on the roofs in small towns like Elkins, where entire communities swayed to the will of winter storms in December. Sleet and ice beat in irregular rhythm against the windows of the home of Steve and Melinda Eichelberger. But on the inside, there was warmth and peace. It was 9 p.m., and dawn would bring Christmas Eve the Eichelbergers were a family, and at this time of year, neither cold nor hardship would keep the family from feeling cozy.